All right then. Now, let's look at reaction to last week's Indigenous statement from the heart. It has become something of a political football today. The declaration at Uluru called for Indigenous empowerment and meaningful constitutional reform rather than mere symbolism. Their call for the establishment of a First Nations voice has seen discussion of a possible Indigenous chamber in Parliament, although the Uluru statement doesn't specifically say what that voice might be. Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce was quick to reject even that suggestion warning Indigenous people not to quote overreach and that a new parliamentary chamber simply won't fly. If you go with something that's um, beyond our capacity to get the Australian people on board with it then it's a self-defeating de proposition. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has also warned that voters are very conservative on the issue of constitutional change. Shireen Morris is a lawyer and senior policy advisor at the Cape York Institute and she's with us from Canberra. Shireen welcome back to the drum. Hi, John. So, first of all, what's, what's your response to the comments from uh, Barnaby Joyce this morning about uh, they, they, we simply wouldn't tolerate a, a third chamber in Parliament? I think the Deputy Prime Minister may misinterpret what's being proposed. Uh, the call in the Uluru Statement for a First People's Voice to Parliament is a proposal that draws on work that's been happening over the last two years. Uh, it, it, it's a compromise proposal really that has arisen between talks between Indigenous leaders on the one hand and constitutional Conservatives on the other and it is by no means in no way a proposal for a third house or a third chamber in Parliament. It's actually a proposal for an Indigenous representative body outside Parliament and outside government that would provide input and engagement with government and Parliament on Indigenous laws and policies. Would that need to be embedded in the Constitution? Because some would say as soon as you start tinkering with the Constitution it can have unintended consequences and you could get competing power bases even if it's not a Parliament. It, it might be a body with a mandate. Oh, ab absolutely. Constitutional reform needs to be very carefully crafted and I totally agree with the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister's comments that the Australian public are inherently constitutional, constitutionally conservative. But that's what I think is so smart and so savvy about the Uluru Statement. Um, what they're proposing is an intrinsically modest and practical proposal. And they've been smart in two ways, in my view. One, they've moved away from from a racial non-discrimination clause in the Constitution. Um, and that was a proposal put forward by the expert panel and the Joint Select Committee, though Chairman Ken Wyatt later moved away from that proposal. Uh, and it was, it was argued by the right, by the political right and by Conservatives, that, that that's a one-clause Bill of Rights that would never get bipartisan support. So they've been very clever to move away from that proposal. The other way that the Uluru Statement presents a very pragmatic approach is that it moves away from the insertion of flowery words in the Constitution and Indigenous people have been very clear throughout the dialogues and years before that they want this change to be practical and in that sense they've heeded the concerns of constitutional Conservatives mm. who would have opposed the insertion of flowery words because they're worried about how the High Court will interpret it. So I think this is a very conservative and pragmatic uh, proposal from Uluru. There is, of course, Shireen, though, the danger that a little bit like with the Republic referendum when they said this is a, a minimalist approach, we're not going to make big sweeping changes here, it's going to be tiny, tiny, that's all people will be able to cope with. And even that was too much. How, how concerned are you that we're going to see the kind of reaction that we saw after Mabo, after Wick, they're going to, you know, going to be taking your backyard along with the hill's hoist, that this is going to yeah. snowball into unintended areas? Oh, there's always going to be irrational fear campaigns, that's par for the course, but I really think we need to start to question this assumption that minimalism equals an easy win because that is fundamentally incorrect. Now, if you look at the history of constitutional reform in Australia, only eight referendums have succeeded. Was any one of those eight a purely symbolic statement? No. They were all practical machinery changes and, you know, John Howard's attempt at a symbolic preamble in 1999 failed miserably. So I think it is a mistake to assume that symbolic words in the Constitution will win. It will get opposed by Indigenous people who say they oppose minimalism and it will get opposed by the con-cons, as Greg Craven calls them, of the world who don't want the High Court tinkering with flowery words. And I'll just... Julian Lisa, MP, is probably the most paranoid about activist <laughs> judges, right? 
person that I've ever come across. And he describes the proposal for a First Nations voice in the Constitution as the kind of machinery clause that Griffith and Barton would have drafted if they had turned their minds to it. Now this is a guy who has run every no case in the past, uh, ran the no case against a republic, against a bill of rights, against local government referendum, but he is willing to stand up in his maiden speech and put his name behind an indigenous body in the constitution. Now I think this is a noble compromise proposal and they've been extraordinarily clever here and we owe it to them and to their unity consensus position to pause and seriously consider what they've put forward in good faith and in the spirit of reconciliation all right, let's bring the panel in, Avril. Um, I'm just interested to understand how that Indigenous body would operate differently to some of the things we've seen in the past. Because my fear too is that when you take the minimalist approach, you put at risk everything you're putting on the line. So really interested in your comments around how that body would operate differently to previous bodies. Yeah, so Professor Anne Toomey at Sydney University has put forward some constitutional drafting that might give effect to a proposal for an Indigenous body like this. And that clause would leave up to Parliament to enact legislation uh, to set out how this body would work, how members would be chosen and all of that. Now, the thing we've been hearing through all the dialogues is that People want this to give voice to the grassroots First Nations of Australia, to the Wick people, to the Yolngu people, to the Yorta Yorta people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, different to bodies of the past like ATSIC that yeah, sort of had exactly. regional representation and were quite top down. I think our challenge now in progressing this conversation is how do we design a structure that is efficient, that is productive, that creates a fairer relationship with government and parliament, but that really gives voice to those grassroots local people. And, you know, I listened to Warren Mundine's comments a couple of weeks ago in Melbourne, and he talked very persuasively about the need to constitutionally empower local people. And I think mm. that's the direction we've got to head in. Shane Wright, I'm interested in your take on, on, on the way that this seems to be uh, active engaging conservatives in the process so that this has a chance of, of getting that kind of bipartisan broad spectrum support. Well, you've already had this morning, uh, this afternoon, George Christensen, uh, well-known conservative out of Queensland, saying no um, to any sort of thing. So you can see uh, that there is a split already. And I was wondering, from Shireen's perspective, whether the how vital will it be to keep the bipartisanship there that is there between Turnbull and Shorten, if for anything to get successful. Oh, bipartisanship is absolutely crucial and you know I think one thing I'd say about the political responses so far is that we should really pause now you know and, and just take time to consider this monumental thing that Indigenous leaders have achieved. They have achieved unity and consensus across political divides, urban, regional, remote. They've come together from across the country and formed a unified position. So I, I, I sort of think that we shouldn't be too hasty to dismiss and oppose and we owe them an open mind and we owe them good faith communication and discussion about this. Um, mm. we, owe, we owe our fullest consideration to the proposals. James, I'm interested in, in your thoughts on this and also whether, because we have seen uh, some corporations become quite active in the marriage equality debate, whether you see corporations <laughs> stating publicly their support or opposition to this process. Uh, look, a lot of uh, companies, large and small, already have made very public their support for the reconciliation uh, process. Um, I've been, I used to run a medium-sized company and um, I worked for a while in a very large company. Both of them were very committed through reconciliation action plans, and they were very practical um, expressions of intent. So they actually resulted in more jobs for Indigenous Australians. They resulted in real training and development programs for Indigenous Australians. So corporate Australia, uh, right across the board, I think has for some time now been doing its bit and recognises the responsibility it, it has. And Shireen, a question I have for you is, I understand that um, um, the a statement from Uluru will now, the outcome of that dialogue will now go forward into the referendum council process which is due to report I think towards the end of next month. So where do you see it going from there? 
Well, I think the next thing that needs to happen is for all the political parties to sit down with the indi indi Indigenous delegates from Uluru and to find a set of words and a set of reforms that works for all parties. And I, I think that rather than hasty dismissal um, and, and premature comments, that's what we should be aiming for. We should be aiming for a respectful dialogue in this conversation because that's the way we're only going to get anywhere. And of course, Shireen, in the statement uh, at, at Uluru, the, the, the call was for all Australians to, to walk with the First People in that. I mean, how is that campaign going to work? Because Recognise has been there engaging people using a lot of social media and so on, but it hasn't necessarily caught the public imagination. Is this, how do you turn this into a moment that all Australians or the majority of Australians can feel invested in? Yeah, well, I think it is, you know, this truly is about all Australians. Um, and I think that's the way we need to view it. This is about making that relationship fairer. And I was at an event in Perth where I heard it put um, so well, the argument that, you know, it's really not asking much for Indigenous people to be given a fair say when Parliament makes laws and policies about Indigenous affairs. So I think a campaign like that, um, that's a simple, justifiable, fair proposition, is one that Australians can get behind. And I also think the, the reflection on the Indigenous culture and heritage mm. that was on display in Uluru, that is Australia's culture. Okay. And I think that's what's got to bring us all together. I'm sure it's not the last time that we're going to talk to you about this, Shreem Morris, but do thank you for joining us from Canberra tonight. Thank you.